SN1 and SN2 describe two different competing mechanisms for a substitution reaction. In general, the reaction looks like this. A compound containing a leaving group on an sp3 carbon reacts with a nucleophile, and essentially the groups switch places. The nucleophile adds to the organic molecule, and the leaving group is displaced. This looks simple enough, but it gets complex pretty quickly. That's because we have these two competing mechanisms. Let's look at the ways in which this reaction can occur mechanistically now. We'll begin with SN2 because that mechanism is actually less steps. We'll start with this alkyl chloride. Now, I realize I have two methyls on this, so this compound is not chiral, but I'm going to draw the chlorine like it's pointing up just to illustrate a point here for this simple example. Our nucleophile is the anion of this sulfur compound, so this might be NASME, so a sodium salt of this sulfur anion. And the sodium can, of course, be thought of as a spectator ion, so we're just going to look at the structure of this negatively charged nucleophile here. In a single concerted step, concerted means that all the bonds are going to break and form at the same time, the sulfur attacks carbon. Now remember, there's an implied hydrogen atom right where we're making our new bond. So carbon already has four bonds. We cannot make five bonds to carbon, so chlorine has to leave. Now, since all these bonds are being formed and broken at the same time, the sulfur needs to approach exactly opposite the chlorine atom. In the SN2 mechanism, inversion of stereochemistry has resulted. The stereochemistry changed at that center. Of course, in this reaction, we also get our chloride ion that has been displaced. Now let's take a peek at the mechanism of our SN1 reaction. We'll begin with this chiral bromide, treat it with acetic acid, and we're going to get replacement of our bromine with the acetic acid. However, in this case, we get two products. We get this compound resulting from inversion of stereochemistry, but we also get this compound where the acetate has added, but it has retention of stereochemistry. Both the bromine and the acetate groups are pointing up. So what happened here? Well, in this mechanism, the first step is the leaving group leaving on its own. Bromine departs the molecule, and that forms an intermediate carbocation. Now, only once we get this carbocation forming can the acetic acid or its conjugate base acetate attack and form these products. Carbocations are planar, trigonal planar, at this center. And so this can now be attacked from the front face or the back face if we imagine it attacking through the bottom of this piece of paper here. If the incoming nucleophile approaches again from the top, we get retention of configuration. If it comes through the bottom, we'll get this inversion of configuration. Since each of these mechanisms gives rise to very different stereochemistry of products, it's important that we're able to distinguish whether an SN1 or SN2 mechanism is going to occur. And there's a few factors that'll go into this determination. The first factor that we'll consider is the most important, and that is substrate structure. There are also solvent effects that play into these reactions. The strength of the nucleophile that we use will also play a big role. And finally, the ability of this leaving group to leave the molecule is also going to be an important factor. Let's begin with our examination of substrate structure. To be consistent, we're going to look at a bunch of bromides here. We'll begin by examining these four bromides. If you're wondering why this guy is all the way over here, we're going to fill in some stuff later. Okay, methyl bromide. This is the first substrate we'll consider, containing only a methyl group and our leaving group. Our next halide is primary. This halide here is secondary, and our guy way over here is tertiary. Now, in this SN1 mechanism, we form a carbocation. So it's really important to think about the carbocation that can form from each of these substrates. And actually, let's start with tertiary first. So here's our carbocation, a tertiary carbocation. 
This is quite stable due to an effect called hyperconjugation. If I redraw the cation and then draw out one of these CH3 groups hanging off of it, there's actually stabilization of the carbocation that can occur from the electrons in these CH bonds and in all of the ones that I haven't drawn out. So we get a lot of stabilization of this carbocation by an effect that we call hyperconjugation. On the opposite end of the spectrum, this methyl bromide, if it were to form a carbocation, spoiler alert, it doesn't, we're gonna draw this one in red, it would look like this. Since it's these nearby bonds that offer the stabilization to the carbocation, this has none of that. We just have a carbon with all hydrogens around it, and this carbocation cannot form. Primary is really bad too. Our primary carbocation would look like this. We have one CH3 hanging off here. Doesn't offer a lot of stabilization. Okay, so what is this telling us? Well, our tertiary halide is great at forming carbocations, really stable carbocations. Since the SN1 mechanism goes through this carbocation intermediate, this substrate does SN1 chemistry, and for reasons we'll go into in a moment, it only does SN1. Now our little red carbocations over here, they are not stable. And so, for these substrates, the only mechanism available is SN2, which doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate. Now what about our secondary substrate? The carbocation that it would form looks like this. And if you can guess from me drawing this in blue, it's pretty stable. This is where this chemistry gets a little bit complex because even though this se simple secondary bromide here is very reluctant to undergo an SN1 reaction, this substrate can actually do both under different conditions. So this might go SN1 or SN2 depending on these factors. Okay, in this blank part of our table, let's fill in some substrates that might be a little bit newer to you. This is an allyl group, and this compound is allyl bromide. This substrate here is benzylic. A benzyl group is the phenyl ring and this carbon. This compound is called benzyl bromide. Let's look at the carbocation that forms with allyl bromide. Now, this might look close to primary, but we have something special going on here, and that special thing is resonance. This resonance stabilizes this carbocation so much that even primary allyl substrates can undergo SN1. But judging from the positioning on this chart, this is also an intermediate case. Allyl substrates can undergo SN1 or SN2 mechanisms. The benzylic carbocation looks like this. This carbocation has extensive resonance stabilization. I'll let you look up those structures, but there are four contributing structures to this carbocation. This is also a substrate that can do either SN1 or SN2 depending on the reaction conditions. Okay, so I want to back up just for a second and tell you why the SN1 and SN2 reactions are named the way that they are. In the SN2 reactions, we have this single reaction step. Well, when we have one step, that is the rate determining step of the reaction. So the rate is determined by this nucleophile coming in and pushing out our leaving group. That rate depends on both of these reagents. Two molecules are involved in the rate determining step. So SN2 stands for substitution, nucleophilic, bimolecular, two substrates reacting in this step. In the SN1 reaction, well, the rate determining step, this sits around until the leaving group leaves, and then this step is gonna be really fast. We have a positively charged thing that's going to be attracted to electrons, and whoop, they come together really quick here. But this thing just sits around until this leaves. And so this first step is our slow step, or our rate determining step. So in an SN1 reaction, the rate only is determined by this compound and how long it sits around until it gives up its leaving group and then the rest of the reaction proceeds rapidly. So substitution, nucleophilic, unimolecular. We can draw a reaction coordinate diagram for each of these reactions. I'll begin with the reaction coordinate for the SN2 reaction. Being a one-step process, it's going to be simpler. <laughs> 
So energy is increasing on this axis, and this just tells us what's going to happen as the reaction kind of moves in this direction. We'll draw our substrate over here. And for an exothermic process, our product will sit at a lower energy. So here are our respective energy levels. And our reaction will pass through a high energy point to produce this product. At this high energy point, we have the transition state of the reaction. And the energy that we have to overcome to get to that transition state is the activation energy. Now, the transition state, we, we don't have an intermediate here. It's just this kicks this out all in one step. The transition state is the part of the reaction where partial bonds have actually formed and bonds are breaking. We can't really detect this. It's not an intermediate, but it's going to happen along the process and bonds are being kind of stretched and new bonds are partially formed. And we can depict this as looking something like this. Okay, so for this reaction, we have the chlorine just starting to leave and the SME is coming in and starting to form this bond. This has to become kind of flat in the middle here. So I have this one sticking up. I'm showing the methyl sticking out at you and the H is going back. And so I think this really shows you how we're getting inversion of configuration here. This methyl has to approach from the back. This is sometimes called backside attack. The SME is coming in, kicking out the chlorine from the exact opposite face. And that's why I drew this pointing up here and this pointing down. Our reaction coordinate for the SN1 reaction looks different. So again, assuming an exothermic reaction where the products are lower energy than the reactants, we're still going to have to traverse a high energy point, but then we get this intermediate along the pathway. So in this case, we get a lower energy dip in the middle where our carbocation intermediate sits. Okay, I think looking at these energy diagrams sets us up to consider how solvent affects SN1 and SN2 reactions now. Solvents for both of these reactions are going to be polar, but in the case of the SN2 reaction, we're going to use polar aprotic solvents. So aprotic means polar solvents that cannot donate a proton to anything. Examples of this are dimethylformamide, or DMF, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, and acetonitrile. There are many more examples. These are just a few. Notice that each of them has polar atoms in it that'll create a dipole in the molecule, effectively solubilizing these compounds and the ions that form, but we don't have any protons here. Now the SN1 reaction is often run in polar protic solvents. Some examples of this are methanol, and we have the proton here. Water is a great polar protic solvent. And another example is acetic acid that we used in this reaction. Let's look just a little bit deeper at the solvent effects and how polar protic solvents are going to speed up the rate of SN1 reactions. In order to speed up the rate, the solvent must be affecting the rate determining step, which for this reaction is the ionization of our bromide. Now we've shown a single curved arrow to depict the bromine leaving and forming this carbocation. However, this substrate isn't just waiting around to pop off its bromide at any given moment. We're going to have the solvent assisting this process. So right before the bromine pops off of this molecule, we might think about this bond elongating a little bit. A bit of positive charge will start building up on this carbon, and this leaving group will start to take on some negative character. And now let's just imagine that there's water as solvent in this reaction. The water molecules can orient their delta negative side toward the forming positive charge, stabilizing its formation. The water can also stabilize the negative charge forming on this bromide as it's starting to leave. As it becomes delta minus, the water can orient its delta positive hydrogen atoms toward the leaving group. And once that leaving group leaves, the water molecules do a good job of keeping the ions in solution by solvating them very well.
in the SN2 reaction were stabilizing this transition state with the nucleophile forming a partial bond and the leaving group leaving with a partial bond, they both have some negative character on them. So it's preferable to have a polar solvent since we have some dipoles forming and we're going to be forming ions in this reaction, but we don't want the solvent to be protic. Well, we have to think about why that is. In order to achieve this transition state, the electrons on this nucleophile need to be available. Let's imagine putting this nucleophile into a solution of the polar protic solvent methanol. This anion is now strongly solvated by all of these hydrogen bonds, and the activation energy to achieve this transition state in a solvent like this becomes much greater. So we still need to use a polar solvent. This has a lot of charge and we need to dissolve it and keep it in solution. However, we don't want to use something that is polar and protic because it will tie up our nucleophile just too much.